Today, man, um, I'm always glad to have the opportunity to share with you guys. Uh, for those who that don't know me, my name is Jeremiah Williams. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And um, I just love getting to do what we do. We, we have a staff that cares tremendously. Our eldership cares tremendously about this church. Every, le- every leader, every volunteer that serves, whether it be Caleb and Emily or, you know, Amy or, or Chris or Maggie, it doesn't matter who it is, everyone feels called to be doing what they're doing for you as a body. And so that is something to be celebrated, um, and we just enjoy doing it. And so um, with that, I got to issue a quick warning for today. Today is going to be seemingly the most contradictory sermon I know that I've preached, but that you may have heard. Or not not contradictory, self-contradictory. Let me say it that way, okay? So there are two big ideas, and I had to structure this in two parts. What up, Brady and Cameron? I had to structure this in two different parts because I'm going to do, we're going to have to do a little bit of a tennis match type idea because there are two huge concepts that uh, circle around the idea of belief. And so in order to do that, I'm going to have to make very bold statements in part one, and in part two, I'm going to have to make very bold statements that seem to contradict the the first part, but it's all going to make sense in the end. Okay, y'all with me? All right, so um, let's do a little, uh, maybe it's team building, maybe it's icebreaker. Uh, Let's split the church in half. So this is the middle aisle. So everyone on this side, if you know how to finish this statement, finish it, okay? Um, Jim, Jim, right? It's good to see you. (laughs) Uh, Okay, here's the statement. God is good all the time. time. Okay, all right, a little, uh, no offense, a little Baptist to you over there. Um, and so, uh, we'll, we'll talk to this side, okay? It seems to be fewer in number, but maybe I see some people who have some great hearts over here, so we'll see how y'all do, okay? So, God is good. All the time. All the time. Okay, all right. So, uh, everyone, my question is, do you believe that? You, you believe that? Okay, so do you believe in him? You believe in him? Okay, so my my third question then, and final question before we jump into this, is slightly different than the previous question of do you believe in him? My my final question is, do you believe him? I believe him. Amen. You believe him. Let's talk about that. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come into your presence, Father. We know that your presence is with us all times, but Lord, there's just something special about gathering with your children and fellow believers, Lord, into the house and singing praises to your name and lifting you up, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the assignment that you gave me today, Father, to lift up the faith of every child that you have, Father God. And I pray, Lord, that unbelief will be arrested in Jesus' name, that you would uproot every area of unbelief that you expose in our lives today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today I want to speak from the topic, from the subject, too good to not believe. Too good to not believe. Like I said, today we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, about belief, but in order to talk about belief, we've got to talk about faith. Okay, so we're going to set this up real quick and then we'll dive in, all right? So just so that y'all know, I'm really big on definitions because I don't ever want to assume that when I say something, we're thinking the same thing, right? Communication is funny that way, okay? So when we talk about faith, one of the definitions of faith is a complete trust. Oh, somebody messing with it back there. Jessica, leave me alone. No, I'm playing. Faith is a complete trust or confidence in something or someone. Complete trust or confidence in something or someone. So when we are saying that I put my faith in Jesus, what I'm saying is I'm I'm putting complete trust and confidence in him. Not only in him, but for everything that he brings to me and everything he brings me, that he brings me to. Does that make sense? Okay. So uh, this is the world famous classic. You've seen it on every T-shirt, every coffee cup. 
you've gone to any Christian bookstore, you have seen this verse, okay? Hebrews 11, 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction, some, some translations say the assurance, but the conviction of things not seen. Now, if you, if you keep going in this chapter, I love this chapter because what the writer of Hebrews begins to lay out is all the people who through faith received the things that they were promised. And it goes in, it talks about all of the Old Testament. It says that all of these people died with the exception of Abraham, died not, re- not fully receiving their promise, but they died believing. With faith, it was accounted with faith. With Abraham, it was accounted as faith for him to believe God for Isaac and that he would become the father of many nations. Okay? So the Bible t- uh, seems to, to let us know that without faith, without a complete trust and a complete conviction of what we have been told, we cannot please God. That's another part of Scripture, okay? Now, conviction, just let's define it real, real quick. Conviction is the state of being convinced. The state of being convinced, okay? Now, if you were to walk up to me, and I've used this example before, if you were to walk up to me and say, Jeremiah, you are a five foot two Mexican man, you would never be able to tell me or trick me into thinking that about myself. Why? Because I am convinced I am a five foot 11 and a quarter (laughs) black man. Y'all, I've been trying to get to six foot my entire life, okay? <laughs> I've been trying to get just got one more inch, man. Come on now. But I am a black man, so there is nothing, and you can't, you can't change my mind about that because I am convinced of it. And because I'm convinced of it, I carry a conviction, a core conviction about that. And as trivial as that seems, that's what, this, that's what Scripture says about those of us that put our faith in Christ, that we are to be so convinced, so compelled by the presence and the power of God and our experience with him, and that we have hope not just for today, but for tomorrow in him, that there is nothing that should be able to shift us and change. Okay? Now, there is a small difference, like I said earlier, in the question that I asked you about belief in him and believing him. And that very small difference, I believe, is what saps us of faith. It's what saps us of belief and trust in Christ. Y'all tracking with me so far? So what do I mean? What I mean, I'm going to break this up into three parts. There are three huge things that we see in Scripture that if we don't believe him, one or all of these three things will be affected, okay? The very first thing is his character, God's character. Now, for those of you that are note takers, I'll put the scriptures up here, but I'm just going to read, a, 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 I'm not going to read all the scriptures. I'm just going to read a phrase from each one um, because it takes way too much time to read all of them. But I gave those to you so that you can go back and read them within context. Also, just so you know, whenever uh, we, uh, Peter posts these, these videos online, he makes the, the scriptures available, okay? So you have that as a resource later in the week to go back and read. So God's character, this is one of the first things that he says that he is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but he is patient towards you. He is patient to, towards you. The rest of the scripture talks about that this is concerning um, salvation, that, he, that he, he wants everyone to be redeemed, okay? The second thing is he is faithful and just. This is what he says about himself. I am faithful and just. The third thing is he does not faint and he does not grow weary. You and I have to go to sleep every day. Some of us have to take a nap (laughs) every day. 
My wife, my wife will amen that. She loves her naps, okay? We grow weary, but he does not faint, and he does not grow weary. The fourth thing is the Lord does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We shift and change with seasons as we discover more and more of ourselves. We, we are like the wind. We blow every which way, but God never changes. And the fifth and final thing is, and there's so many of these, but I just had to, like, for the sake of time, I just had to pick, pull out a couple of them, that he is not man that he should lie. And he also says that he is not the son of man that he should change his mind. So everything that he does, everything that he says, especially concerning you, he did not lie to you about it. And he's not going to change his mind as to whether or not you would receive it. Okay? Now, if we don't believe him, we won't trust his character. Now, if, if, if you trust me as a person, and I say, Gary, I promise you, man, I'm going to bring you a snow cone tomorrow. So he said, he's going to put him in his phone. You, know, you probably have to remind me. All right? If he doesn't trust me, then he won't trust that I'm going to bring it. But if he knows me, and he knows I need to be reminded, then he knows he can take that to the bank, Right? Okay? It's all about tr trust in character. Second thing, his word. Okay, this is a very classic verse, and I'm giving you more. I want you to have more context because it's not, I know we pull verse 11 out so many times and throw it on a t-shirt, and there's so much more that this is actually saying. But in Jeremiah 29, um, 10 through 14 is where, really where you want to go. I actually start in the very beginning of the chapter. Um, but um, starting at verse 10 where you kind of get some of this. But verse 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Okay, this is, he, God has, makes a break in the conversation that he's having with the children of Israel, talking about how they have listened to every other prophet besides the ones that he sent. But then in the middle of telling him all the things that he's going to do because they didn't listen to him, he gives them this promise. And then he goes back into saying all the things that's going to have to happen because they didn't listen to him, okay? But if we don't trust his character, how many of you know if you go through the word, his word is his plan for us? Amen. It's his plan for the redemption of the world. It's his strategy for how to overcome things. Everything in the word points to Jesus and it points to the Father and it points to how he plans to do things in our life. And in the world, right? If we don't trust, if we don't believe him, if we don't believe God, not believe in him, but if we don't believe God, we won't trust his plan. Okay? Next thing, his promises. God, there were so many of these, man, I had to like, mm, nope, 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 no, no, I'm going to take all those, Okay? So same thing, his promises. He's a, there is a, there, the blah, blah. These are some of the promises that he gives us in Scripture, that he gives power to the faint and he increases their strength. Thank you, Lord. That he goes before you. Woo, boy, that'll preach. Somebody better grab me. That he guards your hearts and your minds with peace. That he makes grace abound so you're sufficient in all things and, all, and at all times to abound in every good work. He says that those who seek him lack no good thing. Not part-time seek him, but if we seek him, we lack no good thing. Thing. And the last one, that he is, what I love this, he is watching over his word to perform it. I, lo ooh, I love that, that promise because, it, it, because he doesn't go to sleep, nothing can slip by him. And so he is watching his word to make sure that it performs what he sent it out to do. Listen, guys, God is too good to not believe. 
He's too good. Everything that he says about himself. Now, this is fundamental. Because if we don't believe that fundamentally he's good, then everything from his character to his plan for your life to his promises that he gives you will be undermined because we don't believe this. And this is where the attack of the enemy comes from. The attack of the enemy is to get us to start believing something that God did not say is true about himself. Now, um, Greg and Patty a couple weeks ago shared a testimony um, that kind of actually really sparked this conversation that we're having today. And so, um, as we go into this, what I'm going to seem to say is one thing, but what I'm, but I'm also going to say something else that is equally true, okay? I have seen God do crazy things. I have seen him I have seen him touch people. I, I, I'll, give you, I'll give you a story. Uh, this is probably about eight, ten years ago, maybe. Uh, we were in a college uh, service, and um, God spoke to me. And this was, has probably been the scariest thing that he's ever pushed me to do. Uh, but he told me to go to this uh, newly married couple who the young lady had been told by doctors that she could not have children because her, her cervix was scarred, or her uterus, uterus or cervix was scarred, uh, and it was due to indiscretions in her youth, okay? Now, God told me to go tell her that not only was she going, that, that she was going to bear a child. Okay. I ain't nothing to listen, <laughs> okay? So, I tried to ignore it, <laughs> like, nope, not doing that, I ain't doing it. That's putting you in the category of like false prophet, right? Like that, that's scary stuff. Couldn't get past it, went, spoke it to him, and three years to the date of me saying that, she bore her first child and now she has two. I've seen God do, now, now, listen, you can't tell me he can't do it because that's with my own eyes and ears, all right? What, listen, my, uh, I, had, I was uh, on youth staff uh, at the church that I grew up in, and two of the kids, a so brother and sister, had called me one Sunday. It was like, hey, listen, our grandma is non-responsive. She's in a coma. Um, we want to go up to the, to the uh, uh, what do you call them, nursing home and pray for her because we're not ready to let her go. There's some things that we, we feel like we just need to see her one more time or whatever. And I'm like, okay, bet, let's go. So this is why you need some ride or die people in your life, right? So we started calling, like we got like 10 or 12 people uh, that were all youth, okay? This wasn't youth staff, this wasn't elders, or anyone like that. It was all youth that all rolled together. We rolled up to that, to that one on Pine Tree Road and um, the dark one, and that's across the street from that Catholic church. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And um, we pulled up in there, and we just started praying. We just started praying like we rebuking the spirit of death. We like, like, she is going to be responsive. And within 30 minutes time, she opened her eyes, loved on her kids, and went back to sleep, her grandkids. Okay? Now, I don't know what that meant to them. Well, I do know because they, they needed that last contact. But I'm telling you, I've seen God do some crazy things. I give you, I give you, I, man, I have, I have prayed for people, for parents at altars who were crying out to God for their children who went astray. And weeks later have been introduced to those same children at church. I'm, like there's literally nothing that our God can't do. I was working at Best Buy, God, I, I could go all day with this. I, 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 I was working at Best Buy about, uh, when was I working at Best Buy? 15 years ago? I, I'm old now, all the time starts to blur. And so I was working there, and there was about, outside of management uh, or supervisors of the different departments, there was about 30 to 40 different employees, right? And they were all about our age, some older, which I was always like, bro, you're like 45 years old, why are you working at Best Buy in the computer department? But um, anyway, uh, you, you know, whatever. And so we were working there, and during this time, I was running a college ministry at the church that, uh, that used to be my church home. And within a seven-month period, 
25 plus of the employees who were working there with us were coming to our college ministry. I have seen God bring revival to to Best Buy. Like, we over here praying over warranties and stuff, right? Like, God has done some crazy stuff. And listen, here's, my, here's the thing. I'm not here to tell you that God will do everything. I'm here to tell you that he can. And this is my point. I, I believe that we have gotten so, so comfortable, maybe not comfortable, but boxed in, that we don't even necessarily believe that he can do the things that he says he, he can do. And that is a sad state of affairs. Listen. We, we all have differences of opinions when it comes to certain things, right? And uh, one of these things for me is prayer. Listen, if you, and this is just how I feel about it, okay, because I got the mic, so I'm going to say it the way I think it, okay? If you, if anyone wants to give God, I call it an escape clause in prayer, you know, like God, uh, and this is just how I feel about it. I'm not telling you, this, I'm not saying this is what it is. Okay, I'm just saying this, this is just how I think. Like the, like, God, uh, I pray that you will heal this person. But even if you don't, you know, like that sort of a thing, it's like, we're, it's like you know, and, and, and I know not everyone does, not everyone's thinking that way. But there are some cases where I, I believe that we're kind of giving God a way out because we don't all the way believe him. And I'm just not that guy. Listen, if you, if you want to do that, don't come ask me for prayer. Because I'm going to believe, I'm going to stand on this word that you told me, and I'm, I'm going to believe it for me, I'm going to believe it for you, until he either doesn't do it or says that he won't do it. And that's what leads us into part two. Because it seems like Scripture would require of each and every one of us to, without a shadow of doubt, Believe that God can do anything. But the tension comes in. um, Let me say it this way. What do we do? (laughs) And I've been in this so many times. What do I do? Y'all remember those strong statements. Okay, we're about to switch. All right. What do I do when what I'm reading tells me that he will and that he can, but the situations in my life are saying more like he might. Does that that create tension for anybody? You know what I'm saying? Like, wait, wait, wait. Your word says that you will supply all my needs according to Christ Jesus, and my bank account is low. (laughs) That by your stripes, I'm healed, and I've still been stuck in quarantine. You know what I'm saying? I got you. Like, by your stripes, I'm healed, and we're all healed, but COVID's still running rampant. No? Nobody else thinks, thinks like that? Maybe it's just me. Maybe I just question God like that, okay? But I also... I. I I find myself in this place of, you know, in in the book of Mark, Jesus says, um, he's talking about, you know, speaking to the mountain and and it'll move. And then he says, he says this, he he makes a statement. He says, if you believe you have received it, then you will have it. And that, to me, puts me in a very tricky spot. (laughs) Because it seems like he's saying, when I pray... If I believe it, I'll receive it, but it doesn't mean I'll have it at the point that I believed it and I received it. Because he then says, then you'll have it. So Jesus, what you talking about, man? 
So there seems to be this interaction with the Holy Spirit that when we pray for anything, when we're believing for anything, that it's not yours unless you received it. And sometimes I think that we confuse this part of prayer. That we, we, we don't understand that there, is a, that there will be a confirmation one way or the other in prayer that the Holy Spirit will say, I'm going to accomplish this thing. At that point, now he might not have done it. And I, I can give you case by case by case by case. He, has, he might not have done it yet, but, but how many of you have been in the place to where you're like, oh, I know God's going to do that. You've been praying about it, you've been praying about it, and you're like, oh, I know. Oh, oh, he gonna make that happen. I don't care what nobody says, right? Yeah. Had it, it hadn't happened yet, but you know it will. Oh, yeah. Amen. That's what this is talking about. When you pray, if you believe you have received it, what was the verse? Uh, the, let, me, let me just read it before I, <laughs> but therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. There we go. Okay, but this creates so much tension, and let's talk about that tension. Actually, that was my next slide that I should have did, but we're going to breeze past that, okay? So, if I'm not telling you that he always will, but I am telling you that he can, even when he doesn't, is he still good? Even if he doesn't do what I'm asking him to do, it doesn't change his goodness. If I'm convinced of his character, his word, or his plan for my life, and the promises, if I'm convinced that those things are true, then I can trust that he has something for me in the meantime. Okay, y'all tracking with me? Yeah. So, what does that mean? Like, <laughs> what does it mean that he says he can and he says he will, but what if he doesn't? Let's go to Isaiah 43. We're picking up in, part of, in, in the middle of the scripture and it says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. Check this out. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Now that, just that scripture right there just blows the idea that when I become a Christian, that my life is easy. It just like battleship B-12 blew that mug out the water, okay? And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, You shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. What's the promise? The promise that he's with you. Now, if we don't believe him and fundamentally don't believe that he's good, then that promise right there isn't enough. But I'm here to tell us, that the one thing that is consistent in all of Scripture, throughout all the promises, whether it be provision, whether it be health and wholeness, whether it be breakthrough, or whether it be whatever, redemption, the one, the one thing that God says consistently is, I am with you. So, What do we do? I ask the question, what do we do when, when what we're reading says he will and can, but my situation says he might? What's happening in the meantime? What's happening between I think he will <laughs> because I'm reading it, but he might not because it doesn't seem to be getting any better or it seems to be getting worse. <laughs> That's been the story of my life many times. Okay? I want, to, I want to point out two quick things that, and there's multiple things that he's doing in the meantime, but there's two quick things that I want to talk about. The first thing 
in the meantime is recentering you. Now, the book of Hosea is jacked up, and I love it. Because God makes Hosea, the prophet Hosea, go and take a prostitute named Gomer and marry her. And scripture even says that he puts it in his heart, God puts it in his heart to love her. And the reason that he was doing this was to show Israel his relationship with them. And Hosea constantly, if you read it, read the book, constantly had to go and find his wife and found her in the arms of other men and bring her home. And they had children. And God's like, hey, y'all, this is you. You're the wife. <laughs> no offense to the ladies, but you're, you're all prostitutes chasing things. That's not your husband. And so he says this, you, and man, I love this all, but so beginning in verse 14, he says, therefore, he's talking about, he's now God's speaking to Israel. He's saying, therefore, behold, I will allure her. I will bring her. I will, may, I will cause her to come into the wilderness. And there I will speak tenderly to her. Now, we can, you can, we can speak real kind and tenderly in the AC. Like, that's where I want to have a conversation. Don't stop me outside on the way in the, in the summer to talk to me because it's hot. Talk to me in the AC. But God says, I'm going to bring her into the wilderness. Like, Jesus, I, like, Lord, I've seen what happened in the wilderness. Jesus, the devil showed up in the wilderness. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Anyway, um, but I'm going to take you into the wilderness, and I'm going to speak tenderly to you. Skip down to verse 16. He says, in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. One of the things that God does in the meantime is because we don't seem to understand that the things that we abandon him for to chase after, they actually bring down our walls and not build them up. That every idol that we go to causes ruin in our lives. And he's saying, no, I am your husband. I am your portion. I am the one that you should be ultimately satisfied with. I am your provision. Thank you, Jesus. Why are you going to find sustenance and comfort in the arms or of, of other things? And so God will leave us in the middle of the fire to fix our focus. This is one of the reasons why, uh, and, and, and Patty said this the other day, this is one of the reasons why God does not answer the prayers that, he, that, we, at, well, that we want him to sometimes. It's not because he can't. It's because he's trying to get our focus. And if I answered the prayer, it would be another idol for you. Wow. Help us, God. Help us, God. Does that make sense? Yeah. So God has, so a lot of times God wants to recenter us. Um, and the second thing, uh, oh, yeah, let me say this. Psalms 1167, um, David makes this statement. He says, and I'm like, oh, man, I get this so much. David says, um, before you afflicted me, this is Psalms 11, I believe, Psalms 11, yeah, he says, before you afflicted me, and some translations say disciplined me, um, but before you afflicted me, I led astray. Yeah. I was led astray. But after, I did, what is that? Let me just read it. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. <laughs> Now, listen, one of the things that makes God so good is that he's a good father, which means that he will discipline that booty. He will. Listen, 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 listen. I know we're, I know we're all over the place. On, we, got, we got young parents. We got old parents. We got empty nesters. We got all kinds of things, right? So we vary on beliefs on how to discipline children, Okay. Just speaking for my house. The same way Joshua says, as for me and my house, we go serve the Lord. Here's one of mine. As for me and my house, we go whoop that butt. Yeah, we know. 
So if you get out of line and you start doing the things that you, don't, you, know, you know you ain't supposed to do in order to correct you and bring you back, we got to whip that booty. Now, it's not pleasurable all the time. <laughs> And sometimes it doesn't feel good to get that booty on there. I'm like, boy, you been, this been building up for a week. You getting this butt whooping. All right, but anyway, uh, okay, I was being funny, but sort of, kind of. You know, me and Christy like tag team, like, boom, WWE. Uh, so uh, I'm joking. We're not abusing our children all the time. Uh, so uh, anyway, <laughs> let me stop I'm being silly. Uh, where was I at? Yes. So uh, God disciplines those He loves. Hebrews eleven, not eleven. Uh, Hebrews twelve talks about that. Okay, He disciplines those that He loves. All right. So part of it is in order for us to keep His word. He's like, hey man, I, I gotta let you. I gotta let you kind of go into this. I gotta let you feel the consequences of of your of your decision because it's gonna teach you the lesson. Y'all follow me on that? Yeah. All right. Let's move on so we can stop. Lily, you can come on up here. Where's she at? Oh, there you are. Check this out. The second thing, and here's where we're going to start landing this plane. The, one of the, the second reason that I'm talking about, not, these are, again, aren't the only two, but one of the, the second reason that we're going to talk about today that God does, either he prolongs answering a prayer or he just says, no, I'm not going to do that. It's for the purpose of release. Okay? And let me give you a little context. Um, this is, again, a classic scripture. All right? Um, yeah, you can make sure both your mic, if you'll make sure both her mic and uh, keys are on. Because um, I don't know where we're going to go with this. But... Again, this is a very classic, 2 Corinthians 7. Um, you can read, yeah, read all of it, man. Paul is really, really raw in this. But starting in verse um, 8, well, let me, start, let me start in verse 7. He says, therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, this is Paul, okay? He's talking about the revelations that he has received. In order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Now, listen, this wasn't Satan giving it to Paul, this was Jesus giving Paul a thorn. Here's how I know that. Verse 8, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Of course God would want that, right? He want my comfort. He want me to feel good. He want me to be okay with the situation, right? Verse 9, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, this is Paul's response. Now, he took him a little time to get here, but this is his response to God answering his prayer of taking the thorn away. And God says, no, I'm not going to remove it, but my grace is all that you need. He, so, this is Paul's response. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Let me give you a little bit more. Verse 10, that is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And there seems to be this connection between pain and power. There seems to be this connection between when I have something that is digging into my side that I can't get rid of, the more I cling to God, the more power I walk in in my life. That's just the first part. Because the second part is pain and torment in my life causes compassion and sympathy in my life. So then when someone else walks up to me who might not be dealing with the same thing I'm dealing with, but it's going through pain and pain is equal, doesn't matter what we, how we try to give levels and layers to it, then the anointing is released in my life because of compassion. If you go through the Gospels, and I've said this so many times, if you go through the Gospels and you read just before Jesus did a miracle, in most of them, just before Jesus did, did a miracle, it says that he was moved with compassion. See, some of us tend to think that, that we should just have the license and freedom 
to just say whatever we want to to whoever and that lives are going to change and breakthrough is going to happen and whatever. And God is saying, no, the more and more and more you submit to my process in your life and begin to understand that there are some things, some battles in your mind that I might not give you relief from. This feeling of lust that you can't seem to get a grip on. Whatever the thing is that God says, listen, I'm not telling you not to fight because your job is to fight your flesh. But I'm telling you through the battle, my grace will be sufficient for you. And the strength that comes through your weaknesses will be shown to the world. Guys, he's still too good to not believe that there's a point. There's a point to the pain. There's a point to the power and the triumph. When God does do something awesome, man, it's like, man, I love it. And let me just give you a couple examples. One, one, um, again, my old home church, there was a church secretary, her name was Debbie Bonner, and was sweet as can be. If you've met uh, Becky Harden, she's about like her. She's like five foot two. Debbie Bonner was? Well, we got to talk. Listen, she would, she was the sweetest thing in the world, and she would wrap me up and give me a hug, and she's like, Becky, she would just look you in the eyes, and if you ever met her, you knew that you were loved. You knew you were loved. Well, she got pancreatic cancer. And let me tell you something. The church that I went to, man, when you talk about that, this church, this church is a praying church, and I went to a praying church, but we prayed, and we laid hands on it. We believed, man. Still, she didn't get any better. And I remember three days before she passed, she was sitting in the stairwell of my apartment complex, and she had her head rested on my shoulder. And she was just, her, her health was just, I mean, she, she had jaundice, like her skin was yellow. And it was the worst thing in the world to watch. But she would sit with her head on my shoulder and just doing this on her chest. And one day, this is three days before she passed, I asked her, I said, Debbie, what are you doing? And I would always tell her, man, I'm not okay with this situation, right? Like, you've laid hands on people and seen them made whole. You have, you are, she is a woman of faith. Why is this not happening? She was just, as I'm sitting there watching, she, I asked her that question one day. She looked at me, she said, he's all I need. And I started to realize that she was sensing him more and more, like just right here. That nearness and what it taught me, she passed three days later. And what it taught me was that God is more than enough. It don't matter what's added to me, I've already got everything that I need. You know, that same couple I was talking about that, uh, that she couldn't bear kids and then she wound up having two kids. Well, her husband, years later, fell back into a lifestyle of drugs. And my family have been, was there for him trying to do, what are you doing? What are you doing? And their marriage was dissolved because he couldn't get control of himself. You know, three years ago, uh, I think it was like, might have been two and a half years ago, um, I was doing youth. It's when I was doing, when I was doing youth and Early in the night, some of y'all have heard me tell the story. Early in the night, we received a phone call saying that Cross, our third child, uh, at that time he was four years old, was going to have to go back up to the hospital to Dallas Children to have potentially have surgery again over his stomach. And um, so, being a daddy, I'm like, no, I'm on my way. But I had to. I, I was scheduled to preach the next day. It's a Saturday night, and so I remember I, we were we were in the sprung in the youth again, youth were surrounding me, and I was crying on their shoulders because God kept telling me, do not go up there. Stay here and preach. So I did, and man, God just did some crazy things and some awesome stuff in people's lives, standing in the gap for family members and things like that. And on our way up there, come to find out they're taking the same, they're taking an x-ray again, and the whole, his whole intestines had unclumped. And so we're like, what, 20 minutes from the hospital? And so we have to turn around. Actually, we went up there just to say, hey. But then, like, we came back. Well, this same child, when he was five months old, the original surgery that he had, which was life-threatening, I myself laid hands on him. 
and he still had to go to surgery at five months old. We were still in the hospital for a week. And you know what God taught me? Who, who my children's daddy actually is. Even though he didn't answer the prayer, he taught me so many things. Listen, guys, today, I got this text from Christy today, and I hope you don't mind me sharing, but today marks three months that her dad passed. This is going to be the first Father's Day that Christy, my wife, is going to have without her father. And we believed for healing. We prayed for him. But what has he, what the things that we are seeing unfold in her family's life. I couldn't write that. And I'll give you one more. Uh, I got a friend, uh, y'all know him, Jake and Jacqueline. Uh, Jack, Jake and Jacqueline are married. Jake also has a little sister named Jacqueline, which is crazy. And um, Jacqueline, when I was doing my college ministry, sister Jacqueline um, uh, got cancer and we were praying believing and everything and nothing was happening she seemed to be getting worse all those kinds of things going through chemotherapy it was crazy and it was just enough Jake let me tell y'all something Jake was wild now that boy was doing his thing okay he was up there and Tyler doing whatever he wanted to do and it took his sister getting sick to come home that's when he and I connected. God broke him, and to this day, he is still doing ministry and leading worship. Now listen, after the fact, a couple months later, God touched his sister Jacqueline and healed her. I'm like, why could you not have done that when we were praying? He had a plan. He had a plan to bring Jake. He's too good to not believe. Whatever it is, whether he comes in power and triumph in your life or whether he leaves you feeling dangling, he's too good to not believe. And here's what I want to pray for. So we have two parts, part one and part two, right? Part one is that God can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ever ask, think, or imagine. That's what the Word says. But there are some of us who don't believe it. I don't know if it's how, I don't know if it's how you've been taught. I don't know if there's insecurity in, your, in faith. I don't know. And, and it could be fundamentally we don't believe that he is as good as he says he is or as powerful as he says, as he claims to be. And what God sent me on this first part, what God sent me to do today is to take the cap off your faith and to see him for who he is. That's the first part. The second part is for those warnings in that hateful middle, that hellish middle. You know, I'm reminded of like Lisa's having to trust God with the, with the safety of Tracy. Mile, thousands of miles away, training. Like, do you, we don't understand all the things that are going on in this room. I am shocked to hear the stories of how some of the women in our, in our church have been married for decades to men that don't believe in God and are still loving, supporting, standing in the gap for. And I want for that person to know and understand that he is still good and that he still has your back, that he will not let you go, that he is faithful, he is your security, he's your hope, not the situation that you're in. Not the person that you're with. He's good enough to still entrust and to trust yourself to. Does that make sense? So here's what we want to do. Every, every head bowed, every eye closed, real quick. If you find yourself in that first category, the Jeremiah, I don't even know if I believe he can heal the sick. I don't even know that I trust him to 
to um, move this mountain. I don't even know that I trust him to bring provision and to open up doors that I've never seen open. I don't know if I even believe that. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Okay. I'm going to pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that even now, right now, that you will quicken in your children the faith to believe and to trust you at your word. I pray, Lord, that you will convince them and show them all the times in their life that you have been good and they didn't even know it. That you have been involved with moving mountains and, and, and stripping away sickness and holding off the enemy, the scourge of the enemy in their life. And they've not seen it. Would you show it to them, Lord? I pray, Lord, that in all those times and in all those places in their life, in their past, that they will, will resurrect or, um, or bring up an altar, Lord, as a monument to you that they will continue to remember your word and your claim that you are good, you are just, you are powerful, and you can do all things. Increase the faith in this room. Now, if you find yourself in that second category, man, that man, I've been in this situation so long, I've been dealing with this so long, it started to affect how I see him. That I, yeah, I know he's good. I trust his word. I believe it, but sometimes I'm just frankly not even sure. If that's you, would you raise your hand so we can pray? I see you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray for everyone that raised their hand, for everyone that finds themselves in the middle of doubt, in the middle of a circumstance that seems too overwhelming, that they feel like the water is up around their neck, Father God, and they're, they're, they're too tired to swim. Would you show them, Lord, that it's by your great hand that you have raised them up? That even though you've allowed the waters to rise, Father, you have not allowed their hands to go below. Would you convict them, Father God, of your goodness? Would you show them, Lord, that your grace is enough? That would you, would you recenter them, Lord? Would you turn their eyes back to you? That they would see you and they would proclaim your name. And that they would sense your presence, Lord. Lord, I pray for your nearness. For your nearness. Yes, Lord, I'll do it. Lord, I pray right now for Caleb. I pray for his elbow. I pray for his back. And I thank you, Lord, that he has seen your healing power. He has seen your healing touch in his back before. And I pray, Lord, that he would touch you again. Lord, I speak to his, his elbow, and I say that every ligament will be, bound, will be unwound in Jesus' name, will be attached to the bone, that the swelling will go down, and that no surgery will be necessary or needed, Father. I pray, Lord, that he will, not, will no longer be crippled by the pressure in his back between vertebrae, Father, but that you will release it in Jesus' name, that he will be free to live and to proclaim your goodness to the nations, to worship and to lead in worship all the days of his life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, for every mind that is bound, that is gripped in this place by anxiety, by fear, by depression, we rebuke it in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, for sound minds in this place. Every stronghold that is deep within the souls of your children, Lord, would you expose them by your word? And now, Lord, I thank you for your word that says that we take every thought captive and make it obedient to the knowledge of Christ. Every high thing that, that exalts itself against you, we cast it down in Jesus' name. No longer will the minds of your children be clouded with the things that are opposing you. 
thank you, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for everyone who is, feels afar, everyone who feels like you have discarded them, that you turn their, your, their, your back on them. Would you show them, Lord, that you are the good and perfect father? That like the prodigal son, Lord, that you are the father who is waiting on the rooftop, looking and waiting for your child to come home. For every person who has found themselves away from you, Lord, just like the prodigal son, would they come to themselves and understand and believe that there is food enough, there is provision enough in my father's house. We thank you, Lord, that prodigals will come home that the afflicted, the tormented will be released, that every soul that feels captive to the lies of the enemy, to words spoken over them will be broken in Jesus' name. And we lose wholeness, your righteous virtue, your healing power in this place. Whether it's here, whether it's in the rooms of people watching, Father, from this day, may we be different. And may we trust you, whether you come in power or whether you say, my grace is sufficient. May we trust you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. If you will stand, I'm going to pray over you to release you. Thank you so much for sitting and bearing with me. I hope that today was meaningful for you through worship, through the word, through the presence of God's people, and that you walk out different. If you have a need, and I don't know if you heard this on the, on the announcement, if you have a need for prayer, or if God is speaking something in your life, if God is, is, is doing something even today, even just through today, grab the Connect card and fill that out and put it in the giving kiosk on your way out um, just so we can know what's going on, man. And the ladies uh, that are meeting Tuesdays to pray, they love taking those Connect cards and praying over them. And, um, and so we got some intercessors, man. We got some ladies that are some prayer warriors. And so we're really excited about that uh, kicking back up Tuesday. And so with that, let me pray over you. Um, Y'all okay? Has this been good? Yeah, yeah man. I love you guys. Y'all are awesome. Y'all are awesome. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be with you, to be with your people and in your house, God. I pray, Lord, that you will settle every word spoken, everything, Lord, that your Holy Spirit revealed to your children today. Settle it in our hearts, Lord. Convict us of it. Make it core to who we are and show us how to walk this out. Would you do it in Jesus' name? And I pray, Lord, that we will have an awesome lunch and that you will rebuke every calorie, whether it be sweet tea or steak or mashed potatoes. Do it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We love you guys. Y'all have a great day.